Can you believe that's the last time you get to see that? <laughs> I think we just need to thank Luke for that uh, 80s moment all month long. <laughs> uh, this is our last week in our series, Life Hacks. I'm actually really pumped about what we're going into next month. February, in my opinion, is the worst month in the, in the year. I don't know. I, like, yeah, I know. So, all right, good. Someone else agrees with me. Unless your birthday's in that month in which uh, you're just born in the worst month of the year. Um, <laughs> But you know, we're in Midwesterners, and we're like just striving or trying to make it to summer, you know, in spring. And that's why it's just like it's usually cold and rough. So uh, I'm actually, uh, we're doing a series called Disruptive Joy. And I'm going to be just looking at how do we, in the midst of no matter what, how, how joy just can burst in to our lives um, and really how to be proactive in that. So it's going to be this, I'm making February the best month here at Lakeland. So uh, it might still be the worst month the rest of the place, but we're going to make it the best month here, and then we're going to pour out into our county and, and impact it. So it's going to be fun. But today we finish up the series Life Hacks. Hopefully uh, our goal and our hope is that every week you've walked away with just a little nugget, and hopefully lots of little nuggets, but probably just to apply one little nugget that will propel you forward. If you missed any of the weeks, please go back and watch them online, listen to them. Uh, we've got audio and video versions of them. Uh, but we talked about how to propel your faith forward at the beginning of the year here. Uh, we've talked about how do you propel your relationship, a romantic relationship, whether you're married or dating, how do you do that and propel it forward in a healthy way? Last week, we talked about parenting or mentoring relationships and how, uh, how to do that in a really healthy and uh, exciting way. And today, we're going to be talking about maneuvering the ups and downs of life because the reality is all of us, uh, you can have a great week right now happening and one sentence can uh, bring this thing, life to down like this or up like this so fast. It's amazing how a simple sentence can do that. Like, let me, let me read a couple statements to you that you probably have heard these. Maybe they've been spoken over you, or maybe you've had to say it to somebody. Um, and you can feel the emotion in these statements. It could sound like this. We're pregnant. Or we had another miscarriage. It's a healthy baby. Grandma passed away this week. Uh, you've got a raise coming this week. Unfortunately, we've, uh, we're facing cutbacks at work. You're being promoted. You're losing your job. You won the lottery. Your house is flooding. You got an A on the test. You failed the test. You got the number one spot on the team. Unfortunately, this year, you're going to be second string. Uh, I'm so proud of you. I'm just so disappointed in you. Uh, it's going to be 75 and sunny today. No, you live in Wisconsin, where it will be cloudy and 15. <laughs> yep. But with those, you can feel these kind of ups and downs and the emotions of what we can feel just with statements like that. And uh, I want to just kind of wrestle through or ask this question, because we all will face highs and lows. What's God's perspective for maneuvering the highs and lows? And are there some life hacks to kind of do that better? So we're just going to look at one little passage in Scripture today. It's in, found in 1 Peter. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, that's where we'll be. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at just five verses. Um, and we're going to dive right into this thing. Peter, let me just set the context. Peter is writing to a group of Christians that are under persecution, okay? So they have a life really rough. They're, they are suffering. And he's going to be talking about how, how did them to maneuver this. So if he's giving them some insights, I bet that there are some things that we can also apply from our, or to our lives as we face ups and downs, okay? So we'll start here in verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says this, "'Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.'" Okay, so let's kind of talk this thing through. I love it from the very beginning. He starts by saying, all right, praise, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says this, who has given us, and he's referring to those who, have, who are believers. So he's talking to a group of believers. So if you're a follower of Jesus, these are the true realities for you. And then all these realities that, that he's talking about now can be applicable to us as we face ups and downs and trials in life, okay? So for those of us who have given our lives to Christ, this is now the truth. You've been given a new birth, Okay. So imagine like a new baby who's born, a new baby who's been born. All of a sudden, there's fresh life. That's what the it, kind of the picture is, is fresh life. Now, here's the deal. If you've been a believer for one day or 30 years, this is still a reality for you, is that there's fresh life available to you today in trials, okay? 
So even if you've been a believer for 30 years, there's this new reality that's still available to you, and it's this thing called a living, you've been given a new birth into a living hope. What does it mean? What does it mean when you say living hope? And why, what's the difference between just hope and a living hope? Well, hope is just this idea of hope, but he connects it to a living hope. What's it, what makes it living? It's living because he's connecting hope to the person of Jesus, more specifically, the resurrected Christ, the one who overcame sin and death by, uh, he died on the cross, but then overcame sin and death and was raised to life again. So we don't just have the idea of hope, you have the person of hope, a risen Christ who's actually seated at the right hand of the Father, who will walk with you in life through whatever trials you're facing. Are we tracking? Are you alive? You've had lots of time to drink coffee today, okay? So here's the deal, is that you've got a living Savior, Jesus, a friend, who will walk with you through any situation, speaking hope over your life. At, uh, at the beginning of our series, when I was talking about growing in your spiritual walk, I went into this verse uh, that says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And God's talking to us, he's actually challenging humanity, draw near to me and I'm gonna come and meet you there. I'll draw near to you. Now, why in the world do we want to draw near to God? Well, because God is the one who's the one who will ultimately hand out hope. He's the one giving it to you. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said this, I've told you these things so that in me, I mean, when you put your faith in me and in me, you're going to have peace. You have peace, you're going to have hope. Why? Because in this world, you will have troubles. Anyone have troubles in this world? Anyone ever face troubles? You want to know why? Jesus said, hey, this is something that you're going to actually face. It's part of the promise. You're going to face tri trials. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome this world. So you've got this person, not just this idea of hope. You have a living hope because Christ is alive uh, who will walk beside you and hand out hope because he's overcome the hardest things in this world. Okay, so now continue on in verse 4. He says, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So it sounds like it starts kind of mid-sentence, but it's continuing off of the earlier sentence where he said, you've been given a new birth into a living hope and, now here's the rest of the sentence, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Okay, so now this is how I often picture it, is that, uh, let's imagine in life when life hits the fan and the trial comes, it feels like your legs get kind of knocked out from under you. You ever felt that way in life? So in many ways, I picture Jesus as the living hope to be one piece of the equation that's holding me up. He's under this elbow, care, holding me up. The second portion of this verse, the inheritance that we have in heaven that will never spoil, perish, or fade, is the other side that holds up the other elbow that kind of keeps me from falling. These are these two elements that just kind of carry me and hold me up. And so you've got this one thing. You've got a living hope, Jesus Christ, and you have an inheritance in heaven that will never spoil, perish, or fade. Now, question. Why would an inheritance in heaven be useful to get you through a trial? Why would knowing that you have an inheritance in heaven be good or useful to help you get through a trial? Picture it like this. Anyone play video games back in the day like Pac-Man? You remember this? Anyone? How many lives did you get at the beginning of Pac-Man? Three. Now, if you play for two hours, three hours, the same game, what happens when your third life dies? What happens? You go all the way back to the very beginning, right? What do you, like game creators and designers eventually figure out? They're like, listen, as games were developed, we need to make games that you still get three lives, but then when you lose your third life, your progress is saved. So no matter, like at the end, like... I think, I wonder how many people had like nervous breakdowns because they played a game for like three hours and then they died at the very end of the game. And they're like, no, I got to go all the way back and start at the very beginning. So here's the deal. With, with Christ, it, it's, it's, it's like this. With, or without Christ, it's like the old video game system. There's no peace because all is lost. But with Christ, you have peace because even if I lose this life, all is saved. Does this make sense? Your progress now, all that really matters is safe. It's the difference between finding out like you have terminal illness. Without Christ, all is lost. Terminal illness with Christ, at the end of the day, I can face it because I have a living hope and I have an eternity and a, or an inheritance in heaven that will not perish, 
fade or be lost. Not all is lost. All is saved. And I can handle even this hard thing that I'm facing. So no matter the ups and downs, you've got something that will never perish, spoil, or fade. So I picture it like this. you got your living hope. you got your inheritance. These two things, Jesus Christ and your inheritance in heaven, will hold you up as you face your trial. Now, just because you're held up doesn't, now, doesn't mean you're moving anywhere. Now you're just holding, you're just kind of dangling here. How do you move now? So glad you asked. Verse 5. Now here's how we start to move and maneuver life in the ups and downs. He says, who, and he's talking about the who is the us, we, the believers, who through what? Through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So we, through faith, are shielded by God's power. So now he's going to start to manu- uh, reveal how you maneuver the ups and downs in life. It's going to be through this thing called faith. Faith is your key, if you will. It's the key that will unlock for you something. You want to know what it will un- unlock? It will unlock God's power being revealed over you and poured out over your situation to protect you during the trial. Uh, so this, this shield, God's power over you, what does that look like? Why do you need God's power to shield you? Sometimes his power could look like endurance to uh, handle the hardship. Uh, God could give you the power to love the unlovely. He could give you the power to forgive those who don't really deserve forgiveness. He could give you the power to, uh, in the form of peace that surpasses understanding in the midst of bizarre hardships. God's power is the shield over our lives, over our hearts in this situation. So here's the deal. You got uh, a living hope, Jesus Christ, holding you up. You got your inheritance that will never spoil, perish, or fade, holding you up. Now you want to start to actually move, and you want to experience protection, God's power protection over you. Well, it's called faith that will release that. It's as you, as you say, I'm going to trust in you in this scenario, in this situation, that his faith uh, or that his power will protect you. Faith unlocks God's shielding during the trials. And now in verse 6, he's going to say, guys, Christians, this is what you're made for. Check it out. He says, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. How many of you love facing grief in all kinds of trials? (laughs) None of us love doing that, but he says, in all this, you rejoice greatly, meaning this is what we're made to do. You're made to be able to handle this. Why? Because you got a living hope. you got an inheritance that's secure. And you have a faith that when activated will release his power over you to shield you through that trial. Continue on. Because here's what we get to is uh, ultimately we ask this question. And we always will come to this question. We say, okay, God, so in the midst of my trial, I, I can face a trial because I've got Jesus, my living hope. I've got my internal inheritance, which is secure. I can have faith that protects me or that opens, unlocks the key for his uh, power to protect me. But the big question is, God, why? Like, why go through all Why do this? Why do we need to go through these trials? So glad you asked. Verse 7 tells us the why. Why he allows us to, do, to go through these trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. You don't know how important proving the genuineness of your faith is? It's more valuable than gold, which perishes, even though refined in fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus is revealed. So here now he's revealing the why. The purpose in trials is this. It's to prove your faith. The Greek word that gets translated out as prove can be translated proven, tried, or tested. So he's testing your faith. What, for what, po- what point of testing my faith? Or what attribute of my faith is he trying to test? He's trying to test the genuineness of your faith. Let me say it again. He's trying to test the genuineness of your faith. See, God wants to see and he wants you to see, uh, is your faith the real deal? Let me say it again. God wants to see, and he wants you to see, is your faith the real deal? So you want to know if your faith is real? Go through a trial. You're going to find out. Right? And that's the point. He's like, I want to, I'm going to allow you to go through a trial because it's in the state that we're going to find out what your faith is really made of. 
We're going we're gonna to find out what, what's going on in your heart. See, comfortable faith is actually lazy faith, and God doesn't want our journey with him to ever stall out. So to keep it moving forward, he'll actually allow us to face trials that will move your faith in one way or another. Always. He, he, just, he can't stand stalled out faith. Have you, ever, um, have you ever been to a track meet? I know track meet, watch the track meet, watch the Olympics, anyone. Okay, summer Olympics where they like run a, a quarter mile. So it's one lap around the track. Let's imagine that all these racers, they get up to the line, they, they get in the blocks, starter starts it, shoots the gun. They all start running around the race. They get halfway around the track and uh, the racers, a couple of them just stop running and they just start walking. And then eventually they just sit down in the middle of the track and they start talking to one another. Like, how crazy would that be? How obnoxious would that be? You'd be like, listen, either get up and finish the race or get off the track, right? Because they can't even start the next race until this race is done, and the people are just sitting there in the middle of the track. They're not moving anywhere. Here's what I think has happened for a lot of believers. We're running this race called the Christian life, and for some of us, we've actually gotten to a stage in our life where we're like, you know what? Yeah, I started running, like, I was really excited, but now my walk with God. We're like, we're cool. Like God and I, you, you know, we're cool, right? I'm just going to sit down right now and I'm going to bask in the sun a little bit and just relax. Maybe I'll stretch. I'm just, because God and I, we're just cool, but I'm not really wrong. I'm just, I'm, I'm fine just being here. And you want to know what? God is not fine with you just being there, just stalled out, sitting on the track. So to get you moving either to finish the race or get you off the track, he'll allow you to go through a trial. And you might say, hold on, God wants me to either move down the track or get off the track? Yeah. In fact, in Revelations, God is talking about his, added, or his perspective of the church of Laodicea. And, and this is a church that was right now, quite frankly, sitting on the track of life. They were lukewarm in their faith. And this is what Revelation 3.15 says. I know your deeds. They're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. Are you catching this? God's heart is that the church would either be on fire for him or be cold. Walk away, but please don't think it's okay to chill out being lukewarm. He says, because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. The Greek word there literally means to vomit. It's like God's like, hey, you want to know what lukewarm faith is like to me? It's gross. Like, he's, it's that repulsive. He's like, please move down the track, get off the track, but don't sit on the track thinking that's okay for you to stay there. So he'll allow us to go through trials because he actually wants to propel you down the track. He wants to see your faith grow and be stretched. And so he'll allow us to go through trials to drive our faith in one way or another. So verse 8. Now summarize is really what God wants for us. He says, though you've not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him, you believe in him, and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious what? Joy. He goes, this is what I want for you. And it blows my mind that even though you haven't seen him, you love him. Even though you, you, you're not right, he's not right there in front of you, you're believing in him. And because of this type of faith in action, you're experiencing his shielding power, you're going to experience this inexpressible and glorious joy over you. My kind of summary statement over this is, how do you maneuver the ups and downs in life? We maneuver trials because we have a living hope, Jesus Christ on one side, and we have a secure inheritance holding us up on the other. You exercise our faith muscle to experience him being our shield which provides this inexpressible joy. Okay, so now let's flesh this thing out a little bit and get some life hacks. I'm going to invite my wife on up here and Pastor Jeff. So Pastor Lisa, Pastor Jeff, come on up here, and we're going to have a little conversation about how to uh, kind of some life hacks into exercising faith. So would you just welcome these two by uh, thanking them for being with me all month long? You can see we kicked Eric off the panel this week. Um, no, he's uh, with the high schoolers running a uh, winter retreat for the high schoolers. Uh, but uh, we, it's, it's been fun having them up here. I hope it's been fun for you guys. And uh, basically what we're going to do is I'm going to focus all, we've just got four questions this morning. I'm going to focus all these questions around this idea of faith. Because I think faith is really the crux here of, of as we activate our faith and we learn to uh, kind of 
utilize our faith, that he will release this shield of protection over us and give us inexpressible joy. So let's talk about this thing called faith and how do we do this better. Uh, so let me start with this question. How do you pull out of a nosedive in your faith? How do you pull out of a nosedive in your faith? And so I'll, I'll actually start this one off. Um, and it, it might surprise you for me to even say that I've had moments where I feel like I'm nosediving in my faith, but I have. Now, not holistically in the sense of I'm giving up on God for me, but uh, for me personally, it's been in situations. So it might be like uh, this scenario or this situation I'm going through, I've trusted God with it, and I got walloped over the head. I trusted God with it again. I said, all right, God, I'm going to trust you, and I got walloped over the head again. I trusted God again. I got walloped over, the, and now I'm starting to give up faith, you know, so I'm starting to lose faith. I always go back to this, uh, this quote that says, you're the average of the five people you hang around with most. You're the average, okay? So you're probably not leading the pack. You're, you're somewhere in the middle of the five people you hang around with most is probably how you're thinking. And so what I do is I actually will surround myself, a purpose to have coffee and lunch with people who I know their faith is firing on all cylinders. And I'll just present like, here's the scenario, my situation I'm in the middle of. And what's so funny is they'll often look at it with a fresh set of eyes, fresh faith, and they'll be like, God's got this. See, and the reason why they'll say that is they haven't been walloped 10 times over the head in that scenario. But what, uh, uh, as soon as they're like, God's got this, and you just need to trust him with him. Come on, you got it. I'll be like, all right, God does have this. Uh, because what I really need in that moment is I need someone to do this to my faith. I'm like, I need a resuscitation. And so if I surround myself with other people who are like, God's got this, um, I'll find my faith will just like pop off, take off in, in those scenarios. So... That's one of the things I'll do. Lisa, share a little bit here. I've been in a few nosedives in my life, those points where you get bad news and you just think, I don't know if I want to live anymore. I don't know if I want to wake up tomorrow and face whatever it is. But what I've found, the Bible says that um, the Lord's close to the brokenhearted. So every time I've been in those crisis moments, curled up on the floor crying, those are the moments that the Lord steps in in big ways and speaks to my heart and ministers to my heart. So the life hack, I guess, is just to be aware of his presence in the waiting moments when you're not sure what to do and nothing's going your way, just to listen. God, what are you saying? What are you doing? What do you want me to hear? And I find that he's close to the broken heart. Yeah. He's closer than you think. And talk a little bit about what are, you, what are you listening for? Because here's the, when you're broken, you want to know who also is very present? Yeah. The enemy. Yeah. So discerning enemy attack versus uh, Holy Spirit calling or beckoning. Yeah. So I feel, at least for me, the, the enemy always accuses the Lord. You know, he always says, see, your God's not good. See, your God is not really listening to you. See, you can't trust him. Like the, the enemy is always accusatory. Yeah. He's, and the, the, Lord, he's the accuser right. of the brethren. And the okay. Lord doesn't want me to be crumpled on the floor crying. You know, so he's going to be, one time with Eden, she had pulled out her morphine tube and was going through withdrawal. And the nurse called me and said, I, I'm holding her all night because she's just going through withdrawal. And as a mom, I wasn't there, and it was breaking my heart. And then some curled up on the floor, and I just heard the Lord say, get up. Get up. This is not meant to be a graveyard. This is a doorway. Walk through. I'm on the other side. But it's that, mm -hmm. that encouragement to, I'm here. I'm just, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, you had some In a nosedive, one of the most important questions that I ask myself is, uh, am I pursuing the Lord? Um, and I think, um, you know, if you've, if you've followed God long enough, maybe you know some things that, wow, these are things that really draw me close to God, uh, whether it's worship music or prayer journaling or being around God's people or, you know, what is it? And uh, I think that when you know those things and you're in a nosedive, mm -hmm. it's like, wow, how do I get brought back up again? I think God's already written that into your story. And so knowing those things and coming back to those things. And then there's this quote that uh, I heard from Joseph Stoll. And, uh, and he says, don't forget in the dark the God that you met in the light. Don't forget in the dark the God that you met in the light. That when things get dark, and they will get dark, mm -hmm. um, and things are disorienting, and things are um, very negative and very, you know, without hope, um, there was a moment where you surrendered it all. 
and it was so clear, and you were like, God, you are exactly who you say you are. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you everything, and I'm putting everything on you. Uh, don't forget that moment when things get really dark. Don't forget in the dark the God that you met in the yeah. light. And that what you just said there is such a critical thing. You said it was so clear. Because it is. It's like when, when God is calling you to do something or surrender or something, and it's in this light moment, it's, almost, it's so crystal clear, and yet in the dark, it seems really confusing. Like, was that legit? Was that real? And so that's just such a, a critical piece. The other thing that we had talked about was um, just being okay to call out and to say kind of when you're feeling like you're in a nosedive. Like, I think there's power in saying I feel out of sorts. I know I've said that to Lisa where I'm just like, I just feel out of sorts right now, spiritually, emotionally. Uh, I just feel out of sorts. As soon as I say it, now I have accountability. I have someone else who will ask me about it. But what the enemy loves to do is keep you isolated, um, always in isolation. And in isolation, if you feel like you're getting out of sorts and then you're like, well, I don't want to say it to anyone. So then you're kind of, you start to isolate and then you get further and further off till eventually when life hits the fan, you just kind of walk away. Uh, as opposed to saying, I think the enemy loses a lot of power as soon as you just kind of say, I just feel out of sorts and I need help kind of realigning, getting back in, uh, kind of on track. Um, second question, how do you maintain hope? This is kind of close to the, the last question, but a little different. How do you maintain hope and faith in utter tragedy? So Lisa, talk a little bit about that. When my mom had passed away, I mean, grief is heavy and grief... Um, Time passes, funny. I remember looking at the clock, thinking it had been hours since we heard the news and realizing it had just been a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And it was just this, how am I going to do the next minute? How am I going to wake up tomorrow and do life? Like, I don't, nobody tells you this, how to do this. Um, so I just, in those moments, I have to rem remind myself what God has told me. So the day I have to wake up, you know, and Eden's still going through withdrawal. The Lord said, get up, Lisa. The Lord said, move through the door. I preach to myself. Yeah. I have to preach to myself because the, the enemy is just mean, mm -hmm. and he's not fair, and he throws fiery darts when you're down, you know, like kicking, kicking you when you're down. But it's um, Philippians 4 says that if you're anxious, Give your request to God. But then it says, once you do that, the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. So especially when you're in those suffering, tragedy moments, be on guard. So present it to the Lord so that your heart and your mind will be guarded. And then keep an eternal perspective. This life is so short. Mm -hmm. It's all we know, so it feels long. Mm -hmm. But in the scheme of eternity... It's so short, and it's a breath, and it's, it's and this, not all is lost. I love that. And I this love trial that. will be short. It will be, yeah. It feels like it's forever, but in the perspective of even this life, it's, it's going to be short. You're going to yeah. make it to the other side. Yeah. Jeff, you had some good insights. Yeah, so we have, uh, our story is we have four kids, uh, but I think what a few people know is that we were pregnant six times, and so there were two babies that we lost, and uh, as I think about tragic moments, I think about that emptiness that I had never felt up to that point, that we had never felt up to that point, and um, wow, how do you get through those times? I think God uh, was so gracious, and he gave us... Uh, it's a simple thing, but he just gave us a song. It was a song of truth. In those empty moments, we didn't have the words to express the things that we were feeling, going through, or thinking. And God just like, here's a gift. Here's a lob. Here's a song. And I remember one of the songs being uh, lyrics that would say, he gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. Yet my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. And uh, I just remember playing that song over and over and over again. And it was just reminding me about who God was, even though my circumstances uh, wanted to tell me otherwise. Um, a song was a gift and a powerful voice um, when we didn't have the words. Yeah. And when we were talking earlier this week, we were like, as soon as you articulate it, I'm like, we do that too. We just never, I never put it into words. The search for a song that will actually uh, speak what your heart is feeling. But then here's the key, um, is that one that will direct your heart where to go. So like, don't just look for a song on the radio, some secular song that like, that expresses my heart. Eminem's not going to help you now, okay? <laughs> You've got to find something that, yes, connects with your heart, but that also tells your heart what to do that's biblical. 
like that will preach to your heart, now here's where you go. And then pop that thing on repeat and, uh, and have it minister to your heart. All right, next question. How do you walk alongside others um, who are suffering? So maybe you're doing great in life, but other people are suffering. How do you walk alongside others as they're, as they're suffering? Here's the big thing that I would tell you. Don't give pat answers. And if there's a pat in here, I'm not talking to you. But you know what I mean, those short little uh, quick little nice answers that sound nice but aren't really helpful. Um, and I would encourage you, the two Ps, presence and prayer, are always more important than an answer. Um, be there in, with your presence and pray for them. And that can be praying for them, uh, giving them actually a, a verse that you're praying over them and just come on up and pray a verse over them or send them a verse or a text and say, I'm praying this over you, but be there presence-wise and then pray over them. But don't do the pat answer like... Uh, Someone loses a loved one. Let me tell you the thing, don't go say this. Do not walk in there and say they're in a better place. But theologically, if they've given their life to Christ, that's true. They are in a better place. It's just not the right statement in that moment. The first thing I do when I walk into someone's you know, room after a house after they've lost a loved one is I walk in and I go, man, this sucks, doesn't it? Because that's true. That's where they're at in life. See, here's what we, when we, when we say... Um, they're in a better place. That's the end of the path. But what someone f hears is, I got to get to the end of the path. And it doesn't allow them to actually walk the, the grief journey to the path. You're, you're saying like, let's shortcut it all the way over to the path, over this path. What you need to do is say, no, there's actually a, a journey of grief that's really important that they walk on to that final path of they're in a better place. But if you're trying to shortcut that thing with a quick answer, it's actually will not be helpful. That person will feel a sense of guilt that they, oh man, I'm not rejoicing that they're in heaven as opposed to going, no, it's okay that I mourn because I just lost this person I really loved. Does that make sense? So you, um, don't, don't give pet answers. Validate pain and give them permission to have pain. It's really important to say it's okay and to feel pain and feel uh, this loss right now. Lisa, talk a little bit about even what you experienced. Yeah, once uh, we had the news that mom died, the sheriff came to our house um, then people flooded our home. We had probably 30 to 50 people in our little tiny house, yeah. and they just sat with us. They didn't say anything. They didn't give pat answers. They just sat and cried. But it was like, it was in that moment that we as a family went, we're not alone. We're not alone. Yeah. We can do this. But it was so sweet, and it meant their silence ministered to us. Yeah. Like I think sometimes God really positions his people to do something, to be difference makers mm. uh, for people who are in uh, tragedy. I can remember a time when I was with a, a buddy of mine, and we were hundreds of miles away from home, and uh, we had found out that his dad had committed suicide uh, while we were together. And, um, and, I mean, it was just clear as day. This guy needs to get home. Um, and so whatever it costs, whatever it takes, what, however many hoops we got to jump through, this husband and this father, needs, he needs to be home. And so uh, let's do it. And so I think that God uniquely positions his people uh, to make a huge difference in practical things. Um, you know, play dates for the kids while people are going through tragedy, uh, bringing meals over, whatever it might be. Yep. We can be difference makers. Yeah, and I would say right along with that is to offer coaching where you have an expertise in, in an area of crisis. So, you know, when uh, someone loses a loved one and I'm able to be there right away, um, just being able to say, okay, here's what you do. Most people, when they lose a loved one, they don't even know where, well, like the first phone call they're supposed to make. They just don't know where to start. And so just being able to say, all right, here's the, here's the first phone call you need to make, then the second phone call, then the third. Then you're just going to start going through picture albums and reminiscing and feeling your pain and grief, and that's okay, and that's what you're supposed to do. But a lot of people just don't even know what to do. They just are kind of in this moment of shock shock and awe. And so telling them what to do is really helpful. So uh, most of you probably won't experience that scenario in life, but let's say that you're in the medical field. Uh, you know, Lisa and I have been in uh, you know, a hospital room where they're doing a procedure over uh, uh, one of our babies, a little one. And then we've had, you know, people with us who are nurses. As soon as the doctor walked out, they turned to us and they go, that wasn't okay. That wasn't normal. This is what you need to do and follow up with right away. And see, for us, in that place of like, you're just kind of in this place of shock and you don't know what to do, having someone to say, here's the plan, um, 
because they're an expert there, it's really helpful. And so some of you might be financially wise people. So when someone's having a financial crisis, you're able to say, hey, I can coach you through this. Here's step one, two, and three. Or your house floods and you're a contractor and you're like, all right, I know what to do. This is what you have to do. Step one, two, and three. Because everyone whose house is flooding, some people will literally stand knee deep in water and not know where to start. They're just in shock. And so they need someone to come alongside them and say, here's one, step one, two, and three, and I can walk you through this and walk alongside life as you go through this. Um, Jeff. Yeah, this is just another opportunity to talk about uh, professional counseling. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, a huge opportunity for us to take next steps. I think sometimes people in our lives put us in the position of being a licensed professional counselor. And uh, most of us would say, that's not me. Um, and I think it's okay for us to realize that and to be honest about that. And sometimes when we walk alongside other people, our best position is to walk alongside them as they're going to counseling. Yep. Uh, I just think that's a big, big deal. And, um, and then uh, here at the church, we offer uh, Celebrate Recovery. Hurts, habits, hangups. You want to take next steps? Are you not okay with where you are right now? Uh, let's take next steps forward. Let's get yeah. moving. Um, and some of these things are in place to help. Yeah, and we've said this a couple times throughout this series, but we'll, we'll just reemphasize that you've, we, we, Folks, right here, we start right here. You've got to debunk the idea that counseling is for messed up people. Counseling is for regular people who want to do life even better. And the best thing that you can do is take that step of saying, hey, well, let's go get some, uh, you know, some marital counseling, some support, even when things are good. That's the best time to do it. When things are good, hey, well, we just want to do it even better. But please help debunk this idea that counseling is for the, oh, the really needy people. No, it's for regular people who want to do life even better. Final question. We talk about exercising the muscle of faith. Um, how do you do that? Jeff, start us off. Yeah, so this goes back to you know, you're the average of the five people you hang around. Um, and I think uh, I know this to be true because I've experienced this. Um, faith can rub off. Uh, and so when you're hanging out with people that just have really strong faith, uh, God just has this way of like, you know, you're talking to them, and then you walk away from the conversation, and you're like, I think I believe in God more uh, than when I first started that conversation, because God just does that. Yeah. And so uh, I think it's really important to be uh, around people of faith. And then let us never forget that like uh, some of the people who are the most bold in their faith and believe that God is exactly who he says he is, um, are the littlest ones among us. Um, I've actually heard this from uh, children's ministry volunteers. Sam, you're one of them. Um, and uh, I, I just, I've heard people come up and say, man, I was facilitating a discussion with elementary kids, and they just came out with this statement that reassured me of my faith in God. Um, and so, wow, talk to Andy, talk to Cherry about uh, getting eyeball to eyeball with our yeah. kids, because they believe it. And I think sometimes as adults, we get a little jaded, we get a little doubtful, we get a little whatever, and we just need to see God through the eyes of these, uh, of these young people. You know, I was telling them, I used to grab, when people would come and ask me to pray for them after services, our kids used to be running around a lot more in, in our, this, our spaces, and um, I would often grab one of my kids and just say, pray with me over this person, and the reason, I, this is like, I'm not trying to trick God, but a lot of times I'm like, I know I, I can pray the prayer, but I think this kid's faith is going to push it over the edge. Like, I think this kid's faith, I, like, I know some of my kids, I'm like, man, their faith is going to move this Kelsey, mountain. have Kelsey pray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if there's grab, anything, we're like, get over grab here. Grab our Kelsey. daughter, Kelsey. She will, she will make something happen in your life for sure. Miracles start happening when she prays over people. So it's, it's crazy. Um, uh, all right, the thing I would recommend in terms of exercising the muscle of faith uh, is consider this. A lot of times we, we go, all right, I'm struggling in this situation, and so I want to exercise the muscle of faith over here. And I would suggest actually exercise it in a whole other area, a whole other arena. Let's say you're having a relational issue, and you're like, I want to trust God with this. Try to actually trust God maybe with your finances. You know, I'm going to tr start giving a little bit to the Lord. I'm going to trust him. And then as God shows up faithfully here, I, I call it the cross-pollinization of faith. When I see God faithfully work here, all of a sudden it impacts my faith over here. But this one seems easier because it's not under the fire right now. You know what I'm saying? So I, I trust him in an area that's not fired up so that I can watch him uh, act faithfully, and then all of a sudden I go, oh, yeah, he will work over here. So uh, that's just one of the things I do. Lisa, talk about what you do. So I'm one of those people that if I'm feeling bad, I'll Google my symptoms and then basically be a doctor and decide what disease I have, and then, like, I'm going to no die by 5 p.m. No one else does that here, right? You, know, you like, don't do that. Sorry, honey, I'm dying. 
Um, and then you Google that disease and then read all the <laughs> horror stories, right? And you're like, definitely dying. I'm definitely dying. But I think even in our faith, we can do that. You know, we listen to the world. We listen to the horror stories. And I think the best thing we can do is renew our mind. So if you are struggling with finances, go read how God is the provider all throughout Scripture. You bolster your faith by doing that. If you are praying for healing, go read all the miracles of Jesus, all of those healings, and that bolsters your faith and makes it stronger. My other thing is let people pray for you. I don't, I think it's probably pride, Mm -hmm. but let people pray. I'm like a prayer hog. If somebody says, can I pray for you? I'm like, yep, bring your whole family. They can all pray for you. (laughs) Everybody, make a line. Like, just take it. I mean, I need more people knocking on the door for heaven, the door of heaven for myself, and you do too. You need that community. You need that prayer. So let people pray for you. And I would take that one step further, because a lot of people say, like, no one's coming up and asking, can I pray for you? I don't have the family surrounding me. Um, So here's the faith exercising that muscle would be you go ask for prayer. So take this little walk back to the prayer room and say, hey, could you pray for me? Actually, it's that, that little step that all of a sudden you're like, all right, I'm going to exercise this muscle called faith and ask someone else to pray. The faith grows on the walk. Mm, That's right. Not not only in the room, it's the walk to ask. Jeff, you had some things. Yeah, this picture came to me as we were talking about this this week. Um, Like, what does faith, what does radical faith look like? And I thought about, um, you know, in the summertime when the kids, like, run full sprint to the pool, and it's kind of a sloppy run, and they get to the edge of the pool, and they jump as high as they can. They tuck their legs in, they grab and make the biggest splash they can. It's called a cannonball, right? And I think about that, and I'm like, man, I think that's what faith looks like looks like when we fully believe that God is who he says he is and that he's going to do something. And so, yes, we've talked about speaking truth over our circumstances, but then finally just doing it. And when I was thinking about that, I asked myself this question, when was the last time I took a cannonball of faith? Uh, and if it's been a while, it's like, oh, what is that all about? Uh, God, what, what do I need to know? Uh, what do you need to teach me? Uh, so take a cannonball, take a belly flop, whatever it takes, uh, just do it uh, and see what God might do. Yeah, at least final thought here. Every time I've been at a crossroads, you know, where do you believe, do you not believe, do you trust, do you not trust, any time I'm there, I make a decision and set a course. So I say, yes, Lord, I'm going to trust, and I don't let my heart freak out the next day or the next day. No, heart, you don't get to do that. I've set a course. I'm going to do this because my faith determines my actions. So this is how I'm going to behave. This is how I'm going to think. I'm going to guard my heart, make sure it's not faltering every single day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so setting that course is so important because I think even it can happen on a Sunday morning. How often do we get to a place where it's like, all right, let's trust God. And so on a Sunday morning, you might validly, totally, legitimately go, all right, God, I'm trusting you with this thing. But then you set no course of action. So let's say that you're struggling with fear, and you're like, I trust you. I'm no longer going to fear. But you don't actually set a course of action. So here's what the course of action looks like, is it's you saying, all right, I'm going to memorize this verse that says, the Lord does not give me a spirit of fear or timidity, but a power of sound mind of wisdom. So that when, because guess what's going to happen? Tomorrow, you're going to face fear. That's what's going to happen. So if you just kind of ambiguously go, I got to trust you, but you don't actually set a course for how you're going to deal with it, when that thing comes, you actually haven't really kind of helped you, helped yourself. So Yes, trust him, then set a course to activate, put your faith in action when that thing shows its, rears its ugly face. Make sense? All right, we're going to close here in prayer. And I believe some of you are going to trust God right now and, uh, and, he, yeah, and stay the course, and he's going to be a shield about you. So, uh, Heavenly Father, I pray as many people right now in this room, some are, uh, some are at highs in life and, and some are at lows. And they've got something to trust you with. So I'm just going to give you about 10 seconds right now between you and God. You just talk to him. You just pray pray this meaning in your heart. What's the thing you want to trust him with? That you want to exercise this muscle of faith over this situation, this scenario, this relationship, this thing. Just give that over to him. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would now demonstrate your power working in our lives, being a shield about the situations that we're facing. I pray that you would help us to set a course of action, to renew our minds uh, with Scripture when we face uh, the next hurdle or the next 
accusation from the enemy or this, the, the bad habit rears its ugly face again. And you would help us to set a course uh, to deal with it in that moment. Lord, we trust you. We want to grow in this uh, and be able to handle the ups and downs in life and be able to walk through it with a joy, inexpressible and glorious joy. We pray this all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. We do have prayer partners back here. They would love to pray with you. They'd love it, okay? So don't be afraid. Exercise that muscle of faith and take a walk on over there. Ask someone to pray for you. Otherwise, be blessed and have a great, great Sunday.